what if instead of discrete point charges like two or three, we have a continuous distribution of charge, i.e. a line of charge, a ring of charge, a surface of charge? Well, then we have to think about what the potential is in that case. The good news is that we've already done this for electric field, and if anything, doing it for electric potential is even simpler. So let's talk through the problem solving strategy, and then in the end I'll show you two examples and briefly describe how you can think about doing this for potential rather than electric field. So first we need to model the charge distribution as a simple shape. What does that mean? Well, if I give you a finite wire that's still pretty long, you might as well simplify that to be infinitely long. If you're looking at a wheel, you probably want to approximate that as a disk, so on and so forth. So simplify your shape until it's something you can mathematically model pretty simply. Next, do a pictorial representation. This is incredibly important in where the majority of your work is. Not only do you need a picture of the geometry, but you need a coordinate system that's going to allow you to define your distances, define your directions, and eventually we're going to do an integral. Identify the point that you're actually doing the calculation at, and again that's going to be a generalized point. So maybe you're going to be only doing this on a specific, specific axis, and so this point might be then only along that axis, but you would define its position on that axis in terms of, for instance, z. Just like for electric field, we're going to break the charge into small pieces, delta q, again knowing that we're working towards an integral at the end. The statement is always use the shape for what you already know how to determine v, so when you first do this, it's going to be point charges, because you know how to determine the electric potential from a point charge. But then eventually you'll know what it is for a ring, and you can build a disk out of a ring, and so on. So if you're given a problem where you're actually looking at the electric field for multiple uh, wires, you can just use, sorry, the electric potential from multiple wires. You don't have to derive everything from scratch unless you're told to. You can build from what you already know. Uh, and make sure that you're identifying the distances. The nice thing is we don't have to worry about direction here. Again, electric potential is a scalar, which means that we don't need to worry about components, we don't need to worry about directions, we just need to worry about distances. So this is quite a bit easier than dealing with the electric field scenario. So how do we actually solve this? Well, our final electric potential is simply going to be the sum of our electric potentials from every piece, where we think about this as coming from QI, where this is eventually going to become a surface charge density times a tiny amount of volume, or sorry, uh, that was a volume density times a tiny amount of volume, or surface charge density times a tiny amount of area. So use superposition to actually set this up initially as a sum and make sure that you're leaving as much as possible in terms of variables. We're going to replace that delta Q in terms of our charge density and our coordinate like I described up here, but again for the volume or the area you probably want to only integrate over one of these um, for most for most things you can, and so then you'll have to actually say this volume is some sort of area times the thing you're integrating over. So again, this is the critical step. This is calculus-based physics, so doing this calculus is something that you're expected to be able to do. On the other hand, it's, it's not simple. This is a hard part of calculus. So make sure that you think carefully about this and that you're not just jumping through. In Gauss's law, we normally didn't need to think about the integral. We could just simplify it very quickly. In these sorts of problems, we normally do have to think carefully about the integral. Make sure that you've expressed all distances in terms of your coordinates. Don't have additional r's sitting around. Make sure that whatever you're integrating over has been related to everything you're talking about. Then actually do the integral. Uh, the limits will depend on what you're actually talking about. It might be uh, finite or it might go from negative infinity to infinity. So in the end, check your uh, result and think about your limits. Right? Think about how your object is going to look if you're very, very far away and ask, does that become the, uh, if it's appropriate, the electric potential from a point charge? And remember that not all objects will simplify down to being a point charge. So just to remind you briefly what that's going to look like for a ring, you think about breaking it into little pieces where each one has delta Q. Where at some point away 
from the center along the center axis, and we're going to call this distance z. Now, this is in fact going to be left as a variable, so in the end, we get what our potential is on the axis as a function of z. Now note that we don't actually need to, again, think about any sort of direction. So when I think about what this potential is, all I need is the distance, which is given by Pythagorean theorem, but actually every single delta q is going to have that same distance. So this is a scenario where it simplifies quite nicely because I don't have to worry about any sort of angle, and every single point is actually this distance away. So then you would, in the end, be able to calculate what this is, and this is an example done out completely in the book. So the second scenario is then thinking about a disk. This is interesting because we remember from electric fields that the disk can be used to understand what's happening for an infinite plane as long as you take r to be infinity. So in this case, we actually are going to be adding up different rings, and in this case, each one is going to have a slightly different delta q because you have a di different radius, so each ring has a slightly different area. But again, uh, we don't have to worry about the direction per se, you just get to use this result as long as you do that integration carefully. So this looks really similar to what we did for electric field, but make sure that you're using the equation for electric potential and not actually worrying about direction since electric potential is not a vector.